Welcome to The Pointy End. I'm Keith Sutherland. Today my guest is Rosemary Glacier, the um, endorsed Greens candidate for the um, Epilock Ward in the City of Gradia Bendigo election. So, welcome. Thank you very much, Keith. It's great to be here. Now, you're a glutton for punishment. You were the <laughs> Greens candidate for the election that has just gone, the gruelling election over eight weeks and many weeks beforehand, of course. Um, why is it that you wanted to have a second run? Uh, you're the Greens endorsed, and I, I'll speak a little bit about that, but why all of a sudden you've gone through that campaign, which was a long um, and arduous campaign, and now we're going into council election? Well, I suppose I'd have to say that I actually really enjoyed the first campaign, even though it, it was long, it was arduous, but it was so interesting. I learnt such a lot. The learning curve was just incredible for me. Um, and I met such a lot of interesting people. I learned, look, I've been living in Bendigo for 24 years or something, but I learned so much more about Bendigo because I was actually making an effort to get out there and, and talk to people that I wouldn't normally get the opportunity to meet. So when the opportunity came to stand for council, I had I'd developed an interest in a whole lot more things. And I thought, well, this, this could be fun and, and maybe, I didn't get I didn't get into Parliament, federal Parliament, so I thought, well, maybe I, I can still contribute something at a local level. Okay. Coming back to the endorsement of the Greens, and I spoke last week to Jennifer, yes. the Lockwood Ward candidate, and I'd um, earlier spoken to Michelle, who's mm. a Whipstick Ward candidate. Now, you're standing for um, Epilogue. Yes. Um, now, why is it so important for the Greens to have endorsed candidates? I know that you've got like-minded <clears throat> ideas, otherwise you wouldn't be a, a member of the Greens, but yes. why is it so important that they put it out there that you are standing under their umbrella, but you're standing as an individual, but really with their policies in the background? Yes. Look, look there are a number of reasons, and one is, is the obvious one of transparency. You know, we have our principles, and if we're going to be standing, if we're going to be Greens members standing, we want people to know that, uh, and that, that's not always the case. But the other thing is, I think it's really helpful for people to know that we are Greens endorsed, because it actually tells you where we're coming from. It tells you what our philosophical standpoint is. And the four pillars, the four philosophies of the Greens are social justice, uh, environmental sustainability, um, participatory democracy, which you could also call perhaps community consultation or community um, involvement. And the other one, perhaps less relevant to, to Bendigo, is uh, peace and non-violence. But that, what, what that tells anyone, before I even open my mouth, if they know I'm an endorsed Green, is I will be standing up for social justice. I will keep that in mind when I'm looking at any kind of decision making. I will be standing up for sustainable um, development or sustainability. And I will be very concerned about what the community wants. And, and sorry, I was just, I'm going to add to that. The other thing that's very useful for the voter to know is that because we're endorsed, that just doesn't mean that we've asked the Greens, is it okay if we run? We actually go through quite a, quite a testing probity process. So the Greens actually, the head office actually make sure that we are the sort of people they're happy to have representing them and that, you know, we don't have anything in our background that might come out and cause an embarrassment. So it's actually an extra layer of, of um, guarantee, if you like, of, of our suitability. You, you talk about the transparency part of it, mm. that you're under the umbrella of the Greens and so on, <clears throat> and that's fine, but at the end of the day, about 10% of the people vote federally for the Greens. Right. So not everybody is going to be understanding of what Greens policies are. And I'll pick you up on a couple right. of those things that sure. you talked about. Climate change, um, you also <clears throat> mentioned decreasing um, rainfall, creative planning and major issues. Now, yes. how are you going to be able to, if you get elected to Epilock Wood, how are you going to be able to make that monumental change? Because climate change is really a national issue. I know we should be doing it across mm -hmm. the board, but it's something that's important for the <clears throat> Greens, and that's really the mantra of the Greens. But to bring it back to local government, we're talking roads, footpaths, right. drainage, etc. Yep. Um, how <clears throat> is all that going to gel? Well, all of the things that you've just mentioned, climate change, decreasing rainfall and, and planning, they're all, the local government plays a vital role in, in tackling all of those things. So for instance, if we start with climate change, you know, we all, as you suggested, we all have a responsibility to decrease our carbon footprint. And that includes 
Greater Bendigo. So there's a great deal the council can do, and in fact, I think is, is starting to plan to do in terms of um, making um, council buildings less um, electri uh, demanding of electricity. Yep. Um, you know, solar panels, uh, they're talking about even a sort of a mini grid with um, Bendigo the, Council are pretty yeah, good in that yes, area. Yes, that's right. So that's the kind of thing I'd be wanting to support. And and I, what I don't want to see is is people coming onto council who are going to try and stand against that kind of thing. So um, and the council can also, in terms of planning, you know, um, encouraging public transport, encouraging the sort of planning or the sort of developments where people can walk and ride their bikes, um, encouraging. We've got some wonderful renewable energy industries or businesses in Bendigo, they need encouraging. Um, in terms of decreasing rainfall, well, you know, Bendigo Council can't make it rain more, but we can be more efficient with our water use. Um, we, can, we can encourage tanks on um, houses and schools and even some businesses. Some cities are now recycling water, not just for use in gardens, but they're recycling it to the point where you can drink it. And maybe that's something that we could think about into the future. Um, so, where else? Well, you talked about planning. Well, obviously, planning is planning, a major planning issue. Planning is, yeah. is, is what council does, and the way we, we plan new housing developments, new commercial developments. If, if global warming uh, is kept in, in mind in part of that planning, we can make a huge difference on council to both to the, the quality of life in Bendigo and also to just to that sense of responsibility that we are doing our part to contribute to decreasing the carbon footprint. And, and on that subject too, the other thing that council needs to do and, and I, I believe, I hope, is, is planning to do is keep in mind how we help people adjust to the changing climate. And so we need to consider things like heat islands that develop in cities and the way you uh, you help prevent that by having green open spaces and trees in cities. And we need to consider things like um, helping, helping farmers, how farmers are going to have to adjust to, to um, global warming. So I'm not saying that um, I have definite solutions to these things, but that I just want global warming to be kept in mind when decisions are made, you know, how, how is this decision going to impact on how we cope with the situation that we're finding ourselves in? That, that's great, mm -hmm. and I, I, I admire all those comments. Mm -hmm. The trouble is, you get on council, yeah. you're one of nine. Yes. So you've got to have like-minded people to be able right. to carry <clears throat> that through. Yes. Which brings me to the next point. Mm -hmm. um, with <coughs> your me. ward epilogue, there's probably mm -hmm. 15, 16, who knows mm. at the moment, yes. how many people are going to be standing. Yep. And it's all very well um, to get elected, but you've got to be able to convince your fellow mm. councillors that you want to go down the same yes. path. Have you spoken to anybody at this early stage? I know that um, all the nominations are not in at this point in no. time, but have you spoken to people that you think can be like-minded? Because the way I'm seeing it, particularly in Epilock Wood, mm. because of so many candidates, yes. unless you're sort of running as a bit of a team, it's going to be very, very difficult. Yes. And the fact that you've put yourself out there as the endorsed candidate, mm. I don't mean you, but mm. all three of you yes, are now of across the board. Mm. And if you all get elected, well, okay, there's three like-minded people, mm. but you need to be able to get preference flows to get elected. Well, are you aware, Keith, that the um, state government has recently said that uh, how to vote cards are not going to be included with the candidate statement packs? That I, I spoke to another candidate yesterday, yeah. and I wasn't aware until yes. yesterday that that's so, the situation. I, I look, I'm not quite sure how this is going to pan out. I have spoken to some other candidates and there certainly are candidates who, who have very similar views to me on, uh, on renewables and on you know, social Especially justice one in and your so ward, on. Yes, um, yes so that, that are in my ward, yes, there are. But whether, whether it's going to be possible to do anything about preferences, I'm not sure because I don't know how you even get that information out there. Unless you have a budget, unless you have somebody providing a budget for you. Which... And, and that brings me to that question <coughs> because we look at what happens with the City of Greater Melbourne, um, or Greater Melbourne elections. Mm. Robert Doyle and his team, you all virtually go in one hit. Mm. Other teams do the same thing. This hasn't happened in Bendigo. But realistically, if you've got like-minded people, you're going to be able to perhaps pool your resources. <coughs> if you can perhaps go as a team, three of you, because 
my thoughts are that perhaps other wards in Bendigo might be thinking of similar things in Bendigo because it's going to be so confusing mm. why you're yeah. going to stand out <coughs> amongst the other 15 <coughs> as me. opposed to other candidates that are like-minded. So I yes. just see this election so difficult yes. if there's not the preference flows, if yes. there's not the how-to-vote cards, how's it all going to work? Look, I, I agree with you and um, I don't know how it's going to work out either. And <coughs> I'm, I'm more interested in, uh, in policy than in, in politics as such and preferences and that kind of thing. So this is something I will need but to... But that's a reality. You're, you're not quite, going to get elected. You're quite correct. Right. I'm yeah. just saying this, this is clearly something that I need to, I need to look into. Okay. Yes. Another issue that I, I noticed that, um, in your information, you mentioned about social <coughs> problems, disengagement and frustration among young people. Are you suggesting that perhaps that's an area the council is neglecting in Bendigo? Um, I'm not trying to put you into it, but <clears throat> it's something that you're passionate about and we all need to be because we look at suicide out there yeah. at the moment and the deaths that are happening and, and where are we going wrong? So are you saying that perhaps that's an area that we're not looking after as much as we should be? No, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that it's very much a priority for me. And as I was saying before, um, social justice is something that I think should be front and centre with all decision making and all planning. So when you're thinking about things like um, housing developments, making sure that there's sufficient affordable housing, when you're thinking about giving, giving licences for more pokies, thinking about problem gambling, um, support for, there are some wonderful groups supporting um, youth and unemployed people and so on. Just making sure that those, those groups do get as much support as we can possibly give them. And I have been concerned by, and I think possibly one of the things that prompted that remark was I have heard people comment that um, in reference to uh, antisocial behaviour down the mall and in the car parks and so on, that, you know, we've got to get tough on these kids, we've got to have zero tolerance, and um, <clears throat> oh, excuse me. Um, I just think that the issue is a lot more complicated than that, and that um, we need to look at the root causes of these problems and keep, as you say, trying to trying to deal with those root causes. You know, possibly boredom, possibly lack of, lack of transport, lack of access to the educational opportunities they want, and so on. And you know, I'm not setting myself up as an expert here. This isn't this isn't an area of expertise for me. I'm just saying that. It's, um, it's an attitude that we need to look at social justice and we need to turn to the experts where necessary for advice on how to deal with these problems and not just have a, a knee-jerk reaction to them. And that's a problem because we see with politics in general, um, law and order comes up every state election. Well, it's um, easy, isn't and, it? That's right. We can say, we can talk <clears throat> tough and try and be pragmatic, but at the end of the day, if you haven't got a heart and soul to yes. understand what the problem is, what is the core reason... Mm. These things are going wrong. Nothing ever changes. Now, another uh, final point I just want to talk about was going through that um, bruising election campaign mm. uh, for all that period of time. You obviously decided on Epilock Ward. What are the major issues do you see um, that is affecting the Epilock Ward as opposed to... They're all pretty much the same, well, but <coughs> is there a reason you chose to stand in Epilock? as opposed to the other ones. I know well, you probably lived at Axdale. I've, I've actually lived in Axdale for longer than I've ever lived anywhere else in my entire life. So that was 17 years. <clears throat> um, I suppose the issues that people mentioned were public transport, particularly out along that McIver Road through Axdale, Heathcote. Uh, very few buses out there. Uh, a sense of equity with water use. There's, a, there's definitely a feeling in the community that, that the way water's used is unfair. Now, again, this is a hugely complex issue, but it's just something that I think needs keeping in mind and looking at. Um, protecting biodiversity, and you knew I was going to say that, didn't you? I did. <laughs> but, That's part of the it, Greens but, matter. But, well, it is, but for a very it's good... It's not a bad thing. I'm but, not criticising yeah, it. For a very good reason, and it's something that, it's, it's something that people talk about, and I think people particularly people a little bit out of town, they choose to live out there because they love the bush, they love the birds, and they really don't like seeing that encroached on and damaged. And I think that's something that in Bendigo, you know, I think sometimes we forget how lucky we are with our city in the forest and 
it is easy to think, oh, you know, it doesn't matter if we take these couple of trees and that couple of trees and, you know, it builds up. And there's also a very passionate group who have been campaigning for some time to get the Wellsford Forest International Park. It's the only section of that forest that's not. And I'm strongly in favour of that as well. Um, other issues are, look, jobs are, are in issues everywhere and there's no magic bullet for that. But I think where council can possibly provide support and encouragement for tourism, for local food and wine production. Someone yesterday suggested to me that we should be um, processing and um, distributing local produce locally, you know, doing that production locally. That's an interesting thought. Um, and, and in fact, yesterday where I heard that was at the Heathcote Community House where they had their official opening of the community's garden. And I think that community groups, um, not, not just Epilogue Ward, but, but everywhere, they do such a good job and so much behind the scenes work that until you go to something like one of these community houses and you see the people that come there, the range in ages, the range in interests and abilities, and how much they're getting out of that and how, how those groups are creating out of what could be just a town where you might rent or buy a house and you live there but you don't know anyone, you're certainly not part of a community. As soon as you have something like community house happening and all the activities that go with it and all the welcome, then you feel that you are part of a community and you know there's the sense of pride and so on. So, so yes, community groups and, and there are some great community groups, well, in all of those little towns and also in, in, in a Bendigo. But as you said, you know, most, most issues aren't um, defined by ward boundaries. So most of the things that are good for Bendigo are going to be good for Epilogue district, Ward as well yeah. and vice versa, really. Well, Rosemary, thank you so much for appearing on the Pointy End oh. program today. Um, good luck with the campaign. I know that um, there's not that long to go, the 21st no. of October. Um, all the votes have to be in. So, yeah, good luck with your campaigning from here on in. Right. Thank you very much, Keith. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Mm -hmm.